so welcome to our uh, three-hour education course today. We're not going to keep you three hours, so you don't have to worry about that. But I'm Wayne Jones. I'm the executive director of the Used Car Dealers Association here in Utah, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, present our class to you today. And um, I'm also the uh, founder of IDS Independent Dealer Solutions. Uh, we do plate and title work and provide forms and promotional products and all those things for the dealers. And so we hope that you will uh, uh, utilize those services because everything we do goes to help promoting this industry and helping educate legislators and uh, putting that money back in the industry. So we really appreciate um, those of you who use our title services and so forth. So uh, today we're going to make this as painless as possible. I'm going to go through presentation of bills that we had at the legislature and also some new rules that have taken place or and or are in the process of taking place. And uh, we will go through this pretty quickly today. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, you're welcome to ask that question. I will uh, uh, see if we have an answer for that. Some, as we mentioned before, sometimes we have to look those up for you, depending on how technical that question is. But as we go through this, uh, uh, your document today, uh, this is your document. Make sure you mark it up, put down your questions. So if you open up the inside front cover, uh, you will see that there is uh, the used car dealer, our new text service that we have out there. Uh, this is a notification service for you, so if you text the word dealer to that phone number, that is a notification that goes both ways for you, so this is kind of a reminder piece for you. You know how if you register your phone with Home Depot or somebody like that, they'll send you specials and so forth? It's kind of like that service, but in this case, we only send out no more than, excuse me, no more than two notifications a month of something that's going on. Those are typically things like, remember that this is going into effect on this date, or check your sales tax rate because there have been some changes, or here's something that dealers are having a problem with. So it's an information piece we can send out to you immediately, and you can always unsubscribe to it anytime you want, like anything else. But also, if you're having a specific problem, be it a compliance issue or something else, you can also send that to us as well. <clears throat> so that we can get back to you and give you some information back from that. So uh, that's what our uh, tech service is on the inside of the, of the front cover. <clears throat> Next page is uh, the uh, things we're going to go over today. So if you forget about something, there's a table of contents for you to reference where that is. On the next page is uh, information about IDS and our title service. As you may or may not know, but I think most of you do know that we are operating like a DMV office. We have temporary permits available, but we also do plate and registration for you and, and so you can deliver um, uh, your uh, title work and plates to your customer. Uh, that's been a little problematic as you know the state has kind of run out of decals. I don't know if you've heard that or not but the registration decals they've run out. But we have been able to plan ahead of time and we are one of the very few facilities that haven't run out of decals. And so we're able to get that processing done. Um, also through COVID, you know, the last couple of years we've been dealing with COVID and there's been a lot of times when titles have been tied up in the uh, DMVs or auctions or whatever. If you're having those problems, please call us. We have a solution for that in our title office. Uh, we're able to work with uh, Director Alan Shinney at the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. I can give you his direct number when that happens and he will take care of that or one of his staff will take care of that title that if it meets certain criteria, he can get a title that's tied up in California or Nevada or, or at an auction somewhere and be able to issue a Utah title and not have to wait through that process. That's been very invaluable. That last year there was over 500 titles that they did for us on that uh, for that situation. So uh, we think that's a great service for you to um, have available to you. On the next page is a little bit about our <clears throat> education class. You know, the purpose of this education class isn't just to fill the requirement, but to help have you be have a better understanding of what the law is, and particularly the new laws, and also those things that you may or may not be aware of. Um, since we work with the law a lot, sometimes think, people think we're attorneys. We are, I'm not an attorney. I don't profess to be one and I don't want to be one. But since we work with the legislature a lot and deal with the law, a lot of times we know what's kind of going on and, and what that practical application is. But we remind you we are not an attorney. And more importantly, uh, this welcome letter is to also remind you that you need to invest in your industry. And that would be by belonging, hopefully, to the Dealers Association. It's less than a dollar a day to do that. 
and we hope that that will be uh, something that you would want to put on your expense sheet showing that that's going to cover you at Capitol Hill and with all the different government entities that there are out there because it's really important when all these things come up you may have a problem other people may have the same problem as an association we can solve those problems for everybody so on the next page Roman numeral five is our antitrust statement anytime we have competitors in the same room we remind you that we don't talk about things that are of an antitrust nature such as price fixing or boycotting or those uh, this is one of those take your nice pills kind of thing we don't talk about people or other things negatively so on page seven under Roman numeral seven is our copyright policy we remind you that the forms and the things that we develop here are copyrighted so if you're taking your forms and taking them to your printer please don't do that it's never a good day when I have to contact a dealer or a, or a printer and say, hey, you're in copyright violation. And those come with pretty steep penalties and fines, not only counting the attorney fees. So, so let, and that money that is spent on those forms, that goes to supporting you on Capitol Hill. So, um, so you know that. On Roman numeral page eight is our three locations. Uh, as you know, we have a, obviously a office here in Midvale, but we also have offices in Ogden and Orem as well. So if you're in those areas and you need supplies or you have uh, title issues or something you need to deal with in that, uh, you can. Uh, and also pick up all your supplies here and also all our supplies and, and forms and everything are online as well. We also put some other references there for some legal because we get people call and say, hey, do you have a good attorney who, can, who knows the automotive industry? And so we've listed a couple that we use very regularly with there. And also insurance is a big deal. And, and we're going to probably hear from our insurance guys a little later. Uh, but insurance is also a lot of questions and things that come up all the time. So um, make sure that and you have those references there. I've also put in that right, or excuse me, left-hand column there, uh, the um, email for the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. So if you have issues concerning curbing or need to report something that's not going on, you can call us, but you can also uh, email them and send those that information on to them. Okay. So there's kind of the introduction. Let's start with the fun stuff of the Capitol. Um, this is my 45th session this year. It was as fun the, this year as it has been every other year. It's interesting to be an educator of legislators. These guys who are farmers and ranchers and businessmen and, and school teachers, they all come from all different kinds of professions. And it's our job to educate them on what goes on in your dealerships. And so that's what our role is. And then also with Motor Vehicle and all the other government entities of educating them on sometimes they want to do things that don't make sense on the business side. And they've been very good for us to work with. They've been good and making changes that we need. This year was kind of, we went back from that COVID year where bill numbers were down and so forth. This year was kind of more to normal. There were about 512 bills actually passed. And that was out of about 819 bills that were actually written. There was somewhere between two and 300 bills that never were numbered or written up or whatever. So well over a thousand. So you can see by those numbers that um, there's a lot to watch on Capitol Hill and that's what we do for you. Uh, on all these bills down the right, uh, next to the bill is an effective date. You'll see that they vary in five. In fact, I put the variations of the effective dates down in the lower right hand corner of page one. Uh, depending on if the bill specifies a date or if there's no date, it goes into effect 60 days after the session, which is May 4th, okay? Um, so the first bill I want to talk about is property theft amendments. Uh, you think about, well, why do we care about stolen property? Well, one of the big problems that a lot of dealers is, are dealing with right now is catalytic converters. How many of you in here have had a catalytic converter stolen in the last couple of years? Like almost every hand, right? Everybody's doing this. And so this is what priority bill for us. This bill actually came out of a, a work group out of West Valley City, of which one of our uh, dealers who was a board member sat on that committee. And this is a bill to see how we could curb the problem with people stealing catalytic converters. I don't know that you ever solved that problem totally, just like curbing cars, you know, same thing. But catalytic converters has been a big problem. So uh, this bill, uh, we worked very long and hard on to make sure we could do the best we could to make sure it didn't have a negative impact on you. So let me talk about a couple of things in the bills. This bill actually starts a, a process to monitor those who are, or who are selling uh, these catalytic converters, whether they steal them or they're their own and they're selling them. There's, there has been developed in this bill a process for somebody who's selling it, but more importantly on the purchaser side of what the requirements are for somebody who purchases a catalytic converter. So if I have a catalytic converter and I want to sell it to you, you're going to purchase that from me. This bill put a, um, um, a process in place that we think is going to work pretty well. 
is probably not going to be fail safe. But let me talk about a couple of things. On the bottom of page one, it talks about what a catalytic purchase is, means a purchase of an individual of a used catalytic converter that is no longer affixed to a vehicle. So pretty clear there what that means. But there was a who is not a purchaser. It not means a purchaser of a catalytic is from a business regularly engaged in automobile repairing, crushing, dismantling, or recycling, or salvage. When we read that, we said, well, we're kind of involved in that, but we're not really an automobile repair facility because we're just licensed many times as dealers. So if we were, would we, so we create an exemption for that, and that's what that bolded paragraph is. The exemption also is if you're from a new or used uh, vehicle dealer licensed under Title 41, which is new and used car dealers. So we have been exempted out of all this stuff. So if you turn to the page, it, in these next two pages, it walks you through this process of um, what is required. So for example, if it's a salvage yard or somebody who's purchasing uh, catalytic converters from individuals, you'll look down and if you look at the second paragraph down in item number two there, a purchaser, which would be like an impound, or a, not impound yard, but a, um, a, a scrap metal yard or somebody who's purchasing those, here's what they have to do when somebody brings them a catalytic converter. So they have to put the time and date, then further down, they have to get information on the individual. Then it's they have to list the name and their date of birth, the resident address, the telephone number, a signature stating that they legally own it, that uh, what color, that they have to present a color digital photograph of the person who is selling it to them. They have to put the amount that they paid. And on the bottom of the page, the, end will conduct, uh, the full name of the individual conducting the person. So they know who at the facility is doing that. Top of the next page on page three, you have to give a description of catalytic converter. I think that's pretty standard. They all look pretty much the same, don't they? I don't know. Never seen one bare. Uh, the name, brand, serial numbers, I know most of those don't have, but any identifying features have to be there. Even the weight of the catalytic converter, uh, any unique identifying characteristics, and, you, and they uh, uh, can't accept anything that's been intentionally defaced if there was a serial number or some specific thing there. If it's been specifically altered or defaced, they could, they could not accept it. And all the violation of not doing this is actually a class B misdemeanor. So they put a penalty on that so, so that the people who are uh, purchasing these are not uh, going to be circumventing the system. Okay. The last thing is in the bold print on the bottom as it says that the, uh, the, the uh, purchaser may not pay a seller for the catalytic converter with cash or a gift card. Just a little background on this. A lot of the uh, undercover work that's been done on this during the course of the past year has been uh, with law enforcement is most of these people out here who are stealing these are involved in the drug trade somewhere. Some of it on international theft. Uh, one of the undercover uh, stings they did last summer was they caught some people who were stealing catalytic converters and they weren't selling them to anybody, they were just taking them and throwing them in a storage, a storage um, facility, open up the door, throw these in. They found close to 200 catalytic converters in there and their intent was to put them in a cargo container and ship them out of country. And then they would melt that down for the precious metals and different things that are in there. Now some people have said if we put this, this uh, uh, the question came up at the Capitol, if we put a, a program like this in place, doesn't it just drive that underground a little bit? And the answer from law enforcement is that's where we want it to go because we have a better feel for what's going on underground than we do you know, Joe, Joe Schmo who needs a you know, fix on his drug and he takes a catalytic converter to, um, uh, to a recycler to get some drug money. So we think this is going to help if you, um, and one of the things we put on all these bills is an action item on each one of these. So uh, on the action item on top of page one, it says you, if you have somebody trying to sell you a catalytic converter, you need to make sure that you report that. And we want you to report that to MVED and to us. And also, if you are a victim of that, make sure you contact your insurance company uh, to see how you want to do that. And you'll want to contact your agent to see if that's something you want to claim, depending on what it is. I know uh, last year there was a uh, dealership that was hit for um, over 50, somewhere between 50 and 60 catalytic converters in one night at a new car store. So these are brand new catalytic converters. We heard stories from individuals who, students who were at Salt Lake Community College who somebody went in while they were in class cut off both catalytic converters on this older car. Girl came out and said, gosh, what's the matter with my car? She got home, her dad looked at it, and the converter's been cut off. 
Okay, so there's a lot of victims in this stuff. So we have committed the legislature. We're going to help where we can as an industry. Particularly, we want to know how much is going on. How much does this bill impact what's going on? Once word gets out there to the trade of people who are stealing this, is it going to curtail that or where is it going to go? So that's why we'd like you to report some of this stuff to us here at the association. Anybody have any questions about that? I, I do need to thank a number of our dealers who were involved in that process, our board, but we have a dealer out in West Valley City who was involved very heavily in the drafting of this, and, and we went through and, and helped promote that. We fixed some language in there to make sure we weren't having to do all the, jump through all the hoops if we were purchasing a catalytic converter. So, any questions about that before we move on? If they if they said they're paying less than $100, they don't have to do that. But they still, um, We've asked the and the and the uh, salvage and, and the uh, recyclers have agreed that even people who are coming in that want less than a hundred dollars, we still want to track that, even though the legislation says if it's, if it's offered, and they can't pay them, they have to pay them in a check. They can't pay them in a cash or gift card anymore. So that helps cur curtail that piece as well. Okay, good question. Over on page four is a towing bill. Seems like every year for the last little while we've had towing bills. I'm, I'm appreciative of the towing industry. They have now formed an association. They're getting together and instead of having these little groups of towers out there, they've all gotten together. Uh, they wanted to do some things in a bill uh, this year uh, that a lot, of, a lot of it made sense, but there were some concerns we had. This basically has to do with tax commission sales. So when a vehicle is impounded and nobody claims it, then there's a tax commission sale. The, the uh, impound yard requests that from the tax commission. They come out and have their impound. After notifications have gone out, they go out and sell those vehicles. Typically, it's purchased by the impound yard, or if they, and it has to be an open public sale. So if somebody wants to go in and, and purchase those vehicles, they can. This changes that, and there are some real key pieces in language because words make a difference at the capital. If you look down at the bottom paragraph in paragraph two, this is kind of how it changes a little bit from instead of doing a tax commission sale, they can bypass the tax commission and, and basically it eliminates the tax commission sale and just have under certain conditions, a vehicle can be uh, automatically titled to the impound yard if it meets that criteria. The first thing is that there's two categories. One is the vehicle eight years old or older, or is it seven years or newer? Okay, the first piece here we're talking about is eight years old or older. So the language says, and you look at the third line from the bottom that says the vehicle, if it's been there within 30 days, and you'll notice the word seizure was taken out. When you have line out through, that means that word was eliminated from the legislation. And we changed that to the original notice because the notice has to be within 30 days. If they send the notice out to you as a dealer, and, for, and, and if you don't respond in 30 days, then they can take action. Well, is it the date from the day they impound it, which is the seizure date, or is it the date they sent you the notification? That was a really important piece because it should be from when you were notified. So those of you who are doing buy here, pay here particularly, if you have a vehicle that's impounded, you're going to get a notification. You need to take action. Typically, you, obviously you do because the longer it's in there, the more impound uh, uh, charges, storage charges you have for that. So we made sure that the wording was right, that everything's based on the original notice. Okay, and then if you look at page five, it says that uh, top of page five, it says that if it goes through that 30 day time period, then the tax commission can issue a title to the impound yard rather than going through a sale and all that stuff. So this is eight years old and older vehicles, all the old stuff. And typically a lot of times those are not recovered from, typically by most people. If in fact the tax commission makes the notice, the uh, dealer is issued the title, there's still a 20 day notification that if somebody doesn't come and pick it up within 20 days, then they, uh, the, the, the uh, person who owns that vehicle will get another notification. So we've made sure there's plenty of notifications so dealers and individuals have plenty of opportunity to recover these vehicles if they do. Well, same thing with the newer vehicles, except rather than do it in 30 days, if you turn the page over at 60 days, top of the page it talks if it's been in storage for 60 days, uh, then uh, that uh, happens and again 45. So the newer ones have a longer period of time, seven years older and newer. The ones that are eight years old and older are shorter time, okay? Um, one of the things they also, impound yards wanted to do is change, if you look at the top of page seven, it talks about that they, uh, that they have to report these impounds and it says immediately. 
Part of the problem they were having is you'd have a tow truck operator that wasn't very good on a computer, so when he came into the, into the impound yard, he was supposed to data enter that into the system. Unfortunately, a lot of times they weren't very good about putting VIN numbers in and they were put in correctly and there was a lot of errors. So they actually said, well, can we, have, can we wait till the next business day and have our office staff do that so we have less errors? That's what this change does, it says that they have to do it before noon on the next business day, okay? The issue we wanted to make sure we covered is on the bottom of the page seven that says, in the bold letter, it says, until the tow truck operator or carrier uh, reports the removal, a tow truck carrier impound yard may not collect a fee or begin charging, and that they have to give notice. And the question is, who do they have to give notice to? And that is, at the bottom of the page, the registered owner, a lien holder, so that'd be a registered lien holder, and then over the pages, the last one, we put this language in three or four years ago, a dealer, so if you as a dealer send out a vehicle and it has a temporary permit on it and the notice is put in, you're not going to get notice because it hasn't gone through the DMV process yet. So if it has a temporary permit on it, then they're going to be required to still give notice to the dealer who issued the temporary permit that that vehicle was impounded. Okay? And that's called proof of ownership. And that's a piece that some of the impound yards have had a problem with. Well, you're just the, you're just the finance guy. You have no ownership interest in that. So this clarifies that, that says that they do have ownership interest in that. The last piece in this is a privacy issue. It says that those impound yards can't share that information about any of those vehicles or those uh, things related to that impound. Okay? Questions about that? Sorry, that was kind of a lengthy bill, but important, particularly for you who are buy here, pay here. The next bill is uh, Third Substitute Senate Bill 51. This is one of those bills that encompassed a lot of different things. And Utah our legislation is such that usually you look at the title, you know it's an emissions bill, or you know it's a, a registration bill, or whatever. This is a transportation bill, and it had a lot of, <laughs> a lot of moving pieces in it. The first piece had to do with the expect, uh, expiration of vehicle and registration issues. And, and I don't know how many of you know, but the state's really had a problem getting uh, renew, uh, decals to do renewals for vehicles. And you've heard on the news that, uh, hey, my, my, uh, my vehicle, I went to register, and they didn't give me a permit. Well, so you know, law enforcement has been notified because there's a lot of people who have expired permits but they've actually paid their fees and stuff to the state. So now we're seeing, starting to see some of those decals come back in. Uh, but this says, and they, they put this in cold, that says in the second paragraph there in number 3A, the materials are temporarily unavailable that they may delay the initial. So this legalizes what they've been doing this year uh, so that there, if there is a problem in getting new decals. The other piece of this that dealt with is halfway down page nine in paragraph three there, it talks about vintage vehicles that are 80 model years 81 and newer, there's some changes with that. One is that if it's 81 and newer, you have to have an emissions certificate for this. We had a lot of people who were just getting the uh, vintage plate because a vintage plate does not require an emission test. But now they put a pr on any of that, and now they put it at 1981 and newer, has to have an emissions test. Um, and if it's exempt, then it has to have proof of insurance. So if you have a, a vintage vehicle that falls in that and it's actually a collector and you don't drive it and so on and so forth, you can actually show proof of insurance. And insurance on a vintage plate is different than just your regular car insurance stuff. There's special riders for vintage vehicles as they have there. Uh, some of the, um, let's see, make sure I don't miss anything here. Uh, it talks about the plates in here also that these, um, Historic plates uh, don't have, they have to, um, uh, whether they have to have the reflective material. Remember, all our plates, uh, they have a reflective material on here. This talks about at the top of the page here the division may manufacture and issue a historic plate uh, without a fully reflective face on it. So, in other words, it only doesn't need to be reflective. And then, part two of that is down in uh, about four or five sections there. An owner of a vintage vehicle is not required to display that on the front of the vehicle. So a vintage plate, you'd only need to have it on the back of the vehicle. That's the only exception. State law still says every vehicle has to have a plate on the front and the back. It's a secondary violation. So they can't just pull you over for not having a plate, but if they pulled you over for something else, then they can cite you for not having a plate. The exception to that also is your dealer plate. So you don't have to put a dealer plate on the front and back. Okay. Also in this bill, um, it uh, doesn't require on, the, uh, on that... Um, 
on that historic plate, that vintage plate that you have to make a donation to some organization that's been waived. And then they also changed some of the funding that 50 cents of the registration goes to managing this with the tax commission. The reason we support this bill wasn't necessary for the BAT, but the next piece, if you look at uh, about the third paragraph in the bottom, it says number 10, the Office of Attorney General shall provide prosecution of this chapter. We've always had a problem in motor vehicle, and, and particularly motor vehicle enforcement, that we pass really good laws, but we can't get county attorneys and others to prosecute people, okay? We have a really, really good curbing law that's, that is very succinct. It says who can and who can't sell on an open title, but to get, if we find somebody who's curbed, you know, eight or ten cars and they get arrested, to get the county attorney to prosecute them was really, 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 really difficult, okay? We had a good law, now we need good enforcement. That's what this bill does. So motor vehicle enforcement is funded with temporary permit fees, okay? Their whole division is funded that way. All of government ought to be that way in my opinion, but in this case, motor vehicle enforcement is totally funded by the uh, temporary permit fee that you pay for each one of those temporary permits you buy. They're taking $192,000 of that fund and hiring a specific prosecutor in the Attorney General's office so they can do prosecutions statewide, it's not county by county. That way they'll be able to enforce some of these curbing laws and other things because everybody says, well, there's curbers out there, why don't they enforce it? It's not because they're not getting caught, it's because of the prosecution side. So this is really gonna be a positive piece for uh, prosecution and motor vehicle enforcement will be working on priority issues with that about how they're gonna go about prosecutions and the things that they, they, um, that they go ahead and move forward with. But that part of the bill doesn't go into effect in July 1, so July 1 we'll have a specific prosecutor for motor vehicle enforcement issues and tax commission issues. Any questions about that bill? Okay. Um, having said that, one of the things I wanted to mention lastly about that is if you go back to the effective day where it has actions on there, uh, one, you guys need to educate people about the changes with vintage plates and the emissions piece. But more importantly, if you have, you need to make sure you report these people are violating. And I listed typically some of the things are curbing, odometer discrepancies, salvage and branding, advertising violations. Those are all things that people are violating, but don't, but they, and when they do that, they're outside the scope of a fair playing field for everybody. So you guys are our best eyes and ears out there. And if you're uncomfortable reporting it, you call us. When you report, if you go to MVD, MVED website and you report any of those things, you don't have to put your name on it. You can do it totally anonymously. If you're even concerned about that, call us, we'll do it for you. You give us the information, we'll do it for you. So now that we have that prosecutor in place, we think that's gonna resolve a, a number of different things. Okay, questions about that? Perfect. Uh, on page 12 is identification for vehicle registrations. Uh, this has to do with um, a question that came up of what kind of um, what kind of, um, oh, I missed one, sorry, let's go back to page 11. I jumped to page, sorry, let's go back to page 11. This bill is on state employment amendments, okay? Uh, third substitute, House Bill 304. When it says third substitute, that means they had to go through and rewrite the bill three times because of amendments and changes. Uh, but this is state employment amendments, and the question is, why do we care about state employees? Well, this, I think, is really a good bill from the standpoint of we've always known that if you work for government, you get a job, you never get fired, uh, it's kind of like I'm protected for the rest of my life. This bill changes that. This bill has two effective dates. The bill goes into effect May 4th, but beginning July 1, the supervisors and those in government have to go to training to figure out an incentive pay program, a paid on performance program for state employees. I mean, does that sound good or what? I mean, we should be paying people on what they do, not because they go there and sit in the chair, right? One of the problems that motor vehicle enforcement has had is they have really good investigators and they have really bad investigators. In the title office, they have really good title clerks and really bad ones. And you know what? They have to pay them all the same, and there's no incentive pay or anything. This changes that. So they have, supervisors have to go to training. They have to put a paid-on performance uh, program together. And then there has to be an evaluation. But beginning July 1, which will begin this year, uh, of, uh, they will ha uh, have to uh, put that paid on performance together and to implement that. Uh, motor vehicle enforcement is ecstatic over that because they have some good enforcement officers and some bad enforcement officers. So we think that that's going to be a really good thing and I think it helps all through government to make sure government operates more efficiently. On the top of page 12, we'll go to top page 12 now. 
uh, Senate Bill 64, there was always a question on what ID needed to be used on the TC form, the registration form, where it asked for driver's license number, that sort of thing. This bill clarifies that. If you, and when there's, again, when you line through, this is the old language that says, division for issuing any new registration on sale of a vehicle not sold by a dealer, so that's everybody else, shall require the application, uh, show proof that the applicant or person making the application has a valid driver's license. Not everybody who buys a car has a driver's license. That's always been a problem. So if you look at the new language, we changed that that says, if you look at the last line, it, the applicant has to provide valid, valid government-issued ID. That's different than a driver's license, okay? If they show a passport from another country, if they show any kind of government-issued ID, you put that on the 656 form and you ID what that is. So it's a passport from Venezuela. I don't care what it is. Doesn't matter, but put that now on the 656 form. Sometimes they've been letting those slide through without that information, but from here on out, beginning in May, you'll need to make sure you put that information. So get some government-issued ID to be able to register that vehicle for them. Actually heard of about an experience one of the dealers said, can I sell a car to a blind man that doesn't have a valid driver's license? And I said, well, technically under the law you can't because he has to show you a valid driver's license. But, but the other side of the coin is, yes, you can because he had a government issued ID, an ID card, because he went and bought a car from a dealer because he wanted to have a car available for his family and others who was running him around taking care of things. Obviously, he couldn't do a driver's license. He was blind, couldn't pass the test, obviously, right? And so we think this fixes all that to say it's government issued ID, then it will work. Okay, questions about that? Bottom page 12 is on vehicle modif uh, registration modifications. This is an emissions bill. This came from one of the county's emissions programs. And what they said was there was a lot of people that, um, there was a lot of people that uh, were trying to uh, get out of the emissions program uh, by registering their vehicle at their grandma's house in St. George, okay, or wherever. So they were outside the five emission counties. Okay, um, and so they, uh, when this bill was first written, it said that anybody who registered a vehicle or did a registration from somebody that used false information was guilty of a civil penalty up to a thousand dollars, and it said shall pay the thousand dollars. The way that was written said that if you did that registration and you used his his or her registration information, even if you didn't know it, you could be subject to that $1,000 fine. So we put a provision in the law that fixed that. And we thought this was kind of punitive in nature because it just said, hey, if you're guilty, you get the $1,000 fine, we don't have any option. As we worked through this and with the Senate sponsor, he changed the bill, he struck out all our fix it language and we basically put in there that said, they may do that and anybody who registers isn't responsible then, and it may be issued a $1,000 penalty. So we fix that so you're not gonna be in the middle of that mess, okay? Over on page 13 is vehicle inspection amendments. This has to do with VIN inspections, okay? The VIN inspection, uh, you know, can be done by a police officer. It used to be called police officer inspection. You have it done by a safety inspection. Um, or now it expands it so that somebody from the federal government can do it. Or the other thing on the top of page 14 talks about by other qualified identification person. So in other words, if you have a vehicle, like for example, let's say you had a vehicle go to Idaho that just sold and it had an out of state title, you didn't know it, and you forgot to do the VIN inspection. Motor vehicle enforcement could authorize somebody in Idaho to do that so they don't have to come down to Utah to do the Utah VIN inspection so you could uh, transact the title work, okay? And so that may be something that uh, will help people if they are uh, missing that VIN inspection. On page 14, the vehicle registration amendments, this has to do with, We've talked about this in other classes. It has to do with what's called a RUC charge, road usage charge. This has to do with people who don't drive very many miles on their vehicle and they don't want to pay the full registration fee. And this has to do with registration fees only. So this put into place and expanded the RUC charges a little bit. If you look at right under highlighted provisions, it says beginning on January 1 of 2023, Okay, so beginning this coming January, it said there's going to be a charge of one cent per mile for the road usage charge up to a cap of $130. So for example, let's take grandma car. She only drives 5,000 5, miles a year. If you times that by one cent, she can pay $50 for the, her registration instead of what the normal registration fee is that you just pull out of the book. 
This has an expansion on it. If you look further down, beginning January of 2026, it goes to a, a, a dollar and a quarter. And if you go to um, uh, 2032, that goes to one and a half cents. So this is to help people who, first of all, is to drive, pe get people to quit driving on the roads. If I drive less miles, I'm going to pay less for my registration. But this also allows those who are lower income or who don't use their cars a lot to get a break on their registration fees. Okay. Page 15 is window tinting. Uh, window tinting has always been a difficult one, particularly for law enforcement, because of law enforcement who have been uh, shot at or shot or killed or whatever because they can't see inside the vehicle. You all know that you can have window tinting around your vehicles except for the front windshield has to meet a criteria. But the driver's side and passenger side front window has to meet an opacity test. If you look at that bill, it says that the front windshield has to be 70%. In other words, it, re it emit allows 70% of the light to go through. The front window or the front side window allows less than in the current law was 43%. The amendment in the bill moved it to 25%, and the compromise was actually 35%. So now the new number is. If it has a 35% opacity, then it's legal in the state of Utah. And the question came up of, well, every opacity meter is not exactly the same. They're not exact science. And so there was a provision put in there that there's a 5% tolerance in that as well. So that changes window tinting. And I was really surprised that law enforcement actually wanted to change any of that. And so, uh, but it did pass and it'll go into effect in May. Questions from anybody? <clears throat> Page 16 is on Consumer Privacy Act. This is a uh, this was a bill that was worked on all session long, and it has to do with protection of consumer information. What's the number one crime in America? Identity theft, right? We see that all the time. So this bill has to do with uh, the information that you're collecting of people's non-personal, non-public personal information. Okay, and the data that you're using and how you share it. So there's, this is the attempt at a state law. If you look at the effective date, this doesn't go into effect until December 31st of 2023. So there's going to be time to modify this. They did that later so that the business community, because there's a lot of business that is affected by that on what we do with non-public personal information. Okay, and what you do with that is personal data. Okay, this is going to be enforced by the uh, Consumer Protection Division under the Consumer Fair Practices Act, and it will be prosecuted by the Attorney General's Office. So there's some pretty good enforcement behind that. One of the things that we weren't too worried about this is because we already fall under that. How many of you knew that? Do you know what you have to do with people's non-public personal information? So I put in the column to the left-hand side there what it is, because under the federal government, under the Federal Safeguards Act, you are, have certain requirements that if you collect any non-public personal information, you have requirements that you have to meet. What is considered non-public personal information? Anybody want to guess? You can think about a whole list of things, but it's anything other than name, address, and phone number. And I could probably under, uh, argue the phone number with you, too. Okay, but name and address is considered public information. Everything else is considered private. So even information about vehicles, about any other information is considered non-public information. Under federal law, you are supposed to have a compliance program in place. This has been the law since uh, I think 2003 or four, if my memory serves me right. So a lot of years. And basically what it says is that you have to put under the uh, Federal Safeguards Act a program that outlines what your safety or what your protection policy is for that non-public personal information. I've listed that out there so you can create one on your own. Basically you open up your computer and you start typing typing boy that shows how old I am isn't it? you data input that into your computer sorry um, and I've listed that out there so the first one is organize your business data how are you going to collect your business data are you going to do it on your computer are you going to you know how, how are you going to look at how you structure things you're going to have a DMS system are you going to have you go this through evaluation in your mind and you type all this out because it has to have a written plan Item number two is minimize the risk, okay? I'm going to keep everything on my laptops and on the computers in the dealership. What am I going to do to minimize the risk for somebody getting that information that shouldn't have it? Do I have firewalls? Do I have, am I leaving those computers unattended that somebody could just walk in and do that? So you want to type out, again, I'm going to use type because I'm used to that. They're going to type out on your keyboard what that is specifically, okay? How are you going to minimize the risk? Number two is a disposal plan. 
you develop a disposal plan. It might be every six months we call the shredding company and they come and shred this amount of documents. How many years do you need to keep your documents? Give me some numbers because I usually hear three of them. Depends on the document. Okay, so here's, here's the deal. Some CPAs, which are typically wrong, it, they say you only need to keep business stuff three years. For us, it's different because we're dealers. Dealers, because of odometer disclosure federally, you have to keep everything five years. That means everything in your deal jacket, five years. Some accountants and CPAs say seven years. Some are even saying 10. IRS says if we can show fraud, we can go back as far as we want. Okay, So that's how long you have to keep that information. So if you're going to shred something, maybe you do it once a year, or whatever you do, put it in your document. Okay, put it in your document. The next one is to create a written plan. You can't just say you have a plan and say, well, I do this and I do this. That's why I'm saying you've got to, and if I say type it out, you remember that you're supposed to do it, writ, write it out, correct? You could write it in freehand if you want to. You could write it in any language you want to. You just got to have a written plan. The fifth thing is to train your employees. This is really important because you need to, your employees to know how they need to protect that. You never have employees leave documents on the table that somebody could walk in and see. Had a case where uh, somebody didn't train their employees. The guy filled out a credit app. Every time he'd go make a copy of the copy machine, you know what he did? He hit the number two on the copy machine, so it copied the two copies when he only needed one. What did he do with the extra copy? He took it and put it in the trash, took the extra copy, finished his deal. Guess who was the garbage man that night? That employee, because he took all that information and sold it. Okay, So you got to train your employees and let them know excuse me, what the penalties are for that, so train your employees. Last thing is develop a response plan. This is important because if I bought a car from you today and tomorrow, or today or tomorrow I had my ID stolen, I'm going to go backtrack, right? Where did I give out my non-public personal information? I'm going to call you on the phone and say, I gave you all this information, I just had my identity stolen, tell me why it didn't come from you. That's not hard because now you have a written plan in place that says what I do with non-public personal information. All of you in every dealership should have a plan in place. If you haven't, do it now. Okay? With identity theft where it is, you need to develop it. Be as simple as you want to make it, but make sure it has all the components. Okay? Now we have a state law that's saying you're going to have to do the same kind of stuff anyway. It's probably going to end up paralleling that. The bad news is the federal government is saying we need to enhance the Safeguards Act from what it was before. So if you look at a, if you look, um, one of the things that's going to happen effective December 9th, how that name came up, date came up, I don't know, but beginning December 9th, you these some of these things will be enhanced. For example, I'll just give you one of them. For example, number five under dealer training. All of your employees and you, or somebody in your dealership who is a, quote, qualified individual, has to take training and verify that you've had the training. And that's going to go into your safeguards program, your data information that you typed out, right? To make that easy, we have partnered with a group. This is a uh, used car dealer association program, a, a preferred provider. But if you look across the page on page 17, we put a program together that you can do that education between now and December to show all the things you need to do and to have that verification not only for the qualified individual, but for all other employees. This will be mandatory, it's not optional. You need to do that and you are collecting, no matter how your business and simplified it is, you will need to be in compliance with that. So make sure you get that implemented within your dealership, okay? Further on this subject of Federal Safeguards Act, there is also saying what the focus of the state law is, what do you do with that information that you have? I don't know if you, any of you, I'm sure you've seen this with your bank statements, okay? says who we share your information with, right? We have this program available for, for you, and we typically do this for buy here, pay here dealers, but every dealer can do this. We have about 15, 16, 17 questions that you ask, and we're able to put on here who you share your information with. It's typically focused on affiliated or non-affiliated businesses. An affiliated business would be somebody that's affiliated with your dealership, you have your own in-house warranty, whatever, something like that. There are certain things that you can do within the scope of your business that you can put, yes, we share everything within the scope of our business amongst our employees. The kicker is the non-affiliated people. 
I'm in the car business, I have an uncle who's in the, um, let's say, insurance business, and I want to send him all my customers so he can go sell them car insurance, right? Uh, you can do that as long as your customer knows you're going to give their non-public personal information, and you have to disclose this by federal law. Do you know what the penalty for not doing this is? Where it starts at? $250,000 federal law. So you need to make sure you do this. Question? Yes. Uh, Thanks. I need a drink, so thank you. Go ahead. For you and your retail customers, you don't have to do it from wholesale to wholesale. Cause I, cause I don't do any, I don't if you don't do any retail business, does not apply. So we don't have to take this? That, as far as I know now, th this, is, this all just came up just in the last recent, since the first of the year. Uh, because if you, abs I, my opinion is at this point, if in fact you don't do any retail business, then this would not apply because you're not collecting non-public personal no, information. I, I was just gonna ask. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Thank you for letting me get a drink. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and then the last part of it has to do with um, the Patriot Act to make sure you know the federal law also requires you to know who you're doing business with. You should be doing a uh, background check that shows whether the person you're selling the vehicle to is on the known terrorist list. We have several programs through our National Association that allow you to put in the person's name. So if you're put into Wayne Jones, you hit the button and it says Wayne Jones is not on the known terrorist list. I know I'm not because I looked. Okay? You can actually go to the federal government site and there's 900 and something thousand people on that list. So good luck finding yourself. But they have a system and they will give you a report back. It's either a red light, green light report type of report. If it's a if it's a green light, you put that in your deal jacket, you keep it. But you're required to know who you're doing business with on the retail side. Okay? So retail customers. Um, if, they're, if you didn't give them enough information, sometimes that report will come back with a yellow light that says we need more information. If you get a red light report, you still sell them the car and there's a number to report to the government for. Okay? If somebody's a known terrorist and they're out there buying trucks to blow up stuff, for example. Okay? And I could cite you some war stories about 9-11 relative to that subject. Okay? And I won't do that today for your benefit. Okay? Uh, so make sure you do that um, and make sure you get this, all this privacy stuff because that's going to be a focus over the next uh, year or two on the privacy issues with uh, protecting people's non-public personal information. Okay? Over the page on the back, page 18 is a, uh, a uh, preferred provider of ours that is a auto warranty program, a service contract company. And you can just look that over, but some dealers said, hey, is there a good service contract company that you guys like? This is one of our preferred providers and it's been very, very good over the, uh, over the years. Page 19 is there's always license plate bills, right? I couldn't stand here if we didn't have new vanity plates, right? So the, um, the first one there is a bill that actually did not pass. Basically what it tried to do, as we talked about last year, is revamp the whole specialty plate issue. One of the issues that's come up with vanity plates is the issue of free speech, okay? If I put on my plate, I hate cats, okay? Is that discriminatory, is it, or, you know, I hate girls, or, you know, whatever your thing is. If I put on that plate, is that a limitation of free speech on my part? Some states have determined that in their courts it says they, a state can't restrict that, okay? If you want to use slang words or the F word or any of those kind of stuff, there are actually states back east that allow that, okay? So now it comes back to what is the policy of the state. This bill did not pass, but that was in that. Also, it revamped some of the specialty plates like the collegiate plates and the Boy Scout plates and the autism plates and all those 70 some odd special plates that are out there that there was going to be a new process for that. This was an interim committee during the summer. It went through all of interim. It went through the session, ended up not going anywhere. So, but I expect there's going to be some things that will take place on that. And we have some suggestions for them on how to get the state decal business that go on those plates to save the state a lot of money and to get rid of my three drawers of decals that are downstairs. So. So that is a bill that did not pass, but there were uh, three new plates, well, two new plates. One of them in House Bill 13 is a live-on plate. That was a suicide prevention plate and putting money towards suicide prevention. Uh, the uh, House Bill 88 was a dark sky plate. If you remember last year, they tried to make that one of the standard plates, along with the ski and the other plates. 
Uh, that did not pass last year, but it became a special plate this year. And then the military plate issue just had to do for the military because they were driving down the road and they weren't putting any government plates on the vehicle so they can keep their information in the vehicle rather than having to put it on, on there. Over on page 21 is some RV issues, but you will also want to know about these. Uh, the first one is, um, this is a franchise law for those of you who may be uh, new uh, car dealers. There was some changes to the franchise law. This um, uh, said in audits that if a manufacturer issued you certain documents, the manufacturer couldn't ask for those again in an audit that they were already provided. And then the other thing that was mentioned is on a low volume deer, Someone who manufactures less than 325 vehicles, they didn't fall under the Franchise Act, so they didn't have to set up a dealer uh, distribution system for that. Uh, on the bottom of the page is a Power Sport bill. Um, there's a Power Sport Franchise Act as well, and I know I don't have any Power Sport dealers in here, but we will in future classes. Uh, the Power Sport uh, Franchise Law has worked very well. It uh, has what's called a sunset date, so every 10 years it has to be reviewed. We're 10 years into that. This year that was reviewed and passed. And one of the things that, that uh, the uh, Department of uh, Commerce commented on this is, this is a great example of where government is keeping the balance between manufacturers and dealers, and it's working because they've only had three cases that actually went toward the advisory board. Everything else has worked out before going to that point. So it, the system works, and it, and it makes sense to do that. Uh, page 22 is uh, off-road vehicle safety education. This has to do, came about because of uh, um, off-highway vehicle groups that were tired of seeing people out there and uh, going through the forest and they go out in a meadow and tear it all up. So this is uh, uh, looking at the education piece for driving ATVs. It says that anybody who is going to ride, drive an off-highway vehicle, that would include side-by-sides and uh, you know ATVs, uh, that does not include snowmobiles, but it does include motorcycles, that they have to go through a one-time safety education class. And they have to go through that. Once you have that, you're good. You keep that in your back pocket, show, it's like a card that says, you know, just like your driver's license says, I've taken the safety education course. The one piece in here that was in here originally said that a dealer who is selling an off-highway vehicle or a motorcycle could not sell that to a person unless they could verify that they took the off-highway vehicle class. We said, no, that dog don't hunt. You're not restricting commerce because somebody chooses not to do that. So we were able to take that piece out. The penalty piece for this, if somebody who is out there gets caught doing that, is that they are cited, they go to the judge, the judge decides how much money it's gonna to take to, re, to repair that problem they created. They divide that by $25 and that's how many uh, hours they have to do in restitution so that they're responsible not only to pay that, or not to, to base that on that money, but they have to go back and, and do the reparation for the damage they did for that, okay? Uh, the other piece that this does is it issues a license plate now. You don't have to have a license plate on off-highway that becomes street legal. You get a license plate. Now off-highway vehicles will also have a plate that will be on those. It's, a, it's going to be a tan plate. It started out as green. But everybody decided they're not going to be able to see it because everything's dark color. It's going to be a tan plate. It's going to be five digits. You can't do um, a personalized plate with it. It has to be on the back of the vehicle. Um, and it has to be in... Uh, uh, where, where's the term I'm trying to find? Has to be in an upright position. I'm not sure what upright is because I can take it this way. Is this upright or is this upright? I think this is, but okay. There's discussion for that. So, uh, so that'll be new. They tried to put this on motorcycles as well, this plate, and we're saying, where do you put that on a dirt bike and on off-highway? There is no place to put it. Well, you can go to a vendor and they have little aftermarket stuff you put on. We don't want to force everybody to do that. So we ended up editing that out of this. We amended that out of that. So motorcycles are not required to do the planing part, but they are required to do the education piece. Okay, questions on that? Perfect. Page 24. Outdoor re recreation education. <laughs> this is a great farmer from uh, out in the Duchesne area. He said, we, I think we need to add some things to the, that education program as well as hunter safety. It has to do with closing gates where there's livestock. Apparently people are going down rows, they open gates and just go through and leave the gates open, the livestock leaves. So that now is incorporated into the uh, education programs. The Sovereign Lands Trespassing Amendments on the bottom page had to do with the Great Salt Lake. 
with the reduction of the Great Salt Lake, there is a lot of people who are going out to the Great Salt Lake um, bed where it's dry and are out there like they were at the sand dunes. Okay, uh, So this prohibits that. And the reason they did that is because the Great Salt Lake lake bed has a huge impact on the air quality and, and the emission issues that we have here in the Salt Lake Valley. So when you go out there and break all that crust, when the wind blows, which you all know it does a lot, it picks up all those pieces and goes in here and causes particulate matter in our air just the, as much in the same way cars do. It also goes up into our mountains when it attaches to the rain and the snow and falls, also creates the snow to melt quicker, which means that our runoff isn't what it's supposed to be. So this was kind of an environmental bill uh, as well. On page 25 is an auto cycle. This was just a name change in that highlighted provision. It talks about the steering mechanism instead of a steering wheel because some of the auto cycle vehicles don't have a wheel. They have just a different steering mechanism. The next bill also changed the weight of these off-highway vehicles from 2,500 to 3,500 pounds because you all know they're getting bigger and heavier. And so that will be a change. And then the last bill on page 25 has to do with state park funding. I was really glad to see this because we're really underfunded in the number of state parks we have. You all know how tourism is in our state. It's one of the biggest revenue generators for our state. This put in some ongoing money of about $15 million of one-time money, put in $5 million into UDOT, and then put in $16.2 million of, of, uh, of uh, one-time money. And so that's about $36.2 million that's going to go to state park improvements and access and those sorts of things uh, that is going to be funded by that uh, group. Other bills passed. This is one of my favorite ones. I called it the Zipper Bill, H or Senate, uh, House Bill 76. It's a vehicle merger amendments. And I'm glad they did this, and hopefully people will know. You know, when you go down the freeway and all of a sudden there's a, it says left lane closed and everybody zips over and then everybody gets mad for the guys who are passing the big line of cars. This puts into code that you use a zipper system. Okay? Everybody drives up. doesn't matter what lane you're in. When you get up to where you have to move over, everybody takes their turn. Okay. If please see people that cut in and, and don't take their turn, they can cite them now for that. So I call it the zipper system for construction zones. Okay. There's, there's a bill for everything, I'm telling you. Okay. Uh, electronic vehicle registration has to do with if you want to keep your registration on your, uh, your vehicle registration on your phone, you can do that now, which you really could. This just clarified some things with that. Those are all the bills that we did at the Capitol. There's a couple things we did in changes on rule. Okay, and this is a top of a letter that we sent on actually Valentine's Day, February 14th, and it has to do with rule. When the legislature passes laws, they say, for example, you can't do deceptive advertising. Rather than do, putting all the things that what is deceptive advertising in the law, they promulgate a rule that says here's the rule of what deceptive advertising is or means. This has to do with a rule. So if you look at this, um, has to do with this. You are all familiar with this. Talked about this last year, told you it was going to change, didn't we? You know what this is? If everybody says, I've never seen that before, you haven't been paying attention. This is your dock fee sign. How is this one different than your last one? In your last one, in this line, it says that the cost of the contract represents costs, and what did it say? And profit. You do not have that and profit in there anymore. You cannot charge uh, or have your dock fee be profitable to your dealership. You have to only do it to cover your costs. So a new sign that, that is available for you, you can pick them up outside. I didn't put them in your packet because I didn't want to staple them in there. Then you can make copies if you need to, reduce them. This has to be displayed in your dealership where you do your closing or where you talk to your customer about signing the documents and doing all that. Can you charge different amounts of doc fees to different people? Charge everybody the same, okay? If you do, you're opening yourself up to discrimination, okay? Um, this rule change will, is effective immediately. Okay, we've already gone through the rulemaking process. We presented to the tax commission. There was a hearing. There was a 30-day time period. Is now in effect. Okay, so you can go ahead and change that again. We have copies of that out there. How do you figure out what your dock fee amount is? Whew. What are you charging? Don't tell me. What are you charging? Okay. What are you charging? Okay. Okay. I'll take that. Take an average. Is that how you do your dock fee? Some of you are going to go, yeah, that's kind of how I do it, but you're not going to admit it, right? When you do a dock fee amount, you need to make sure that it only applies to things that relate to the titling and licensing and processing of title work. 
We have an Excel spreadsheet that's available for members only. It gives you all those things that apply to that, and you put the data across this side as the things that apply to your dealership. You plug in all the numbers. At the end of the exercise, in the bottom right-hand corner, it will tell you how much your dock fee is based on your expenses. Okay, there's a lot of things that are involved in this side. If you want to create your own, good luck. We worked on ours for three years. Okay, we have that available for members, so make sure you're not charging more than what that totals up to, and you should review that at least once a year. We recommend twice a year. So make sure your dock fee is, is uh, covered properly. Over on page 29 are the rules that we talked about. The first ones are DMV rules, things that apply to titling and licensing. If you look at, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are some things that clarify. For example, halfway down the page in the underlying thing, it talks about the ownership interest and clarifies ownership interest that says if you're the registered lien holder of a vehicle that you are um, able to get that information. Uh, notification on salvage, okay? How many of you are using this form, the TC814? If you have a vehicle that's branded, this goes where on the vehicle? Passenger side, front window facing out, okay? So lower right-hand corner of the vehicle. You need to make sure you're posting this. If you have an enforcement officer come in and say, do you have any branded vehicles out there? Yeah, the red one on the corner, he's going to walk out and look for one of these. If you don't have one, he could cite you, okay? So make sure you have that there as well, okay? Uh, over on page 30, I'm not going to go through all these, I'm going to leave the rest of these to you. Uh, over on page 30 are the motor vehicle enforcement rules. So this is the motor vehicle enforcement side, not the DMV side. I'm not going to go through all these. Uh, paragraph 11, halfway down, is just a housekeeping piece. Uh, but under A of accuracy, you need to make sure that you're, when you advertise a vehicle that has a branded title, you have to identify that right after year, make, and model. Okay, you can't hide it in there. You can't put power steering, power brakes, branded title, custom wheels. You can't hide it. Okay, you will get cited for that. Uh, in price, what do you have to put in your price in your advertising? What do you have to put in there? It says right there. Halfway down where it says price, halfway through the paragraph, it says the advertised price must include charges that the customers pay for the motor vehicle, including freighter destination charges, dealer prep, and dealer handling. If you have those three things, they have to be included in there. Everything else, that's the next section, the following bottom paragraph says the following fees are not required. Okay? And then it lists those are the top examples. Documentary service fee, undercoating charges, um, and then taxes or fees, say sales tax, any of those state mandated fees do not have to be included in your advertised price. Okay? Another fix that we did is in mileage statements, a couple paragraphs below that, because we always said if we put in mileage, how do we know if it's right? If we put in at 12,875 miles, what happens if it turns over 1,300 because of test drives? Am I in trouble? So we added language to that that says at the time of the advertisement. So if you put miles in, that's going to be determined at the time of the advertisement to clarify that. Okay, and then uh, paragraph BB again states that issue about making sure it, it goes in. This is the specific part about that a branded vehicle has to be right, notified right after a year making model for that. The last one on paragraph A at the bottom of the page has to do with replacing a dealer plate. If you lose a dealer plate, you make sure you report it to your local G or a stolen, you report that to your local police jurisdiction. You also report it to the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. If you don't do those two things, you don't get a replacement. If you need a replacement, we clarified this because in, before it, you could only get it at time of expiration of your license. So in there, the last part of that says, upon the request of the licensee, replacement or lost or stolen plates are at the discretion of the division. Replacement of a special place may be available upon availability. The production of the special plates you know, notice we struck out only after it has been expired. We took that out so that during the course of the year, if you need a new plate, you can do that. Now, understand the new prison is moving when? This summer. The new prison is done. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's getting close to being done. That, who prints our plates? Prisoners do. The state's investing millions of dollars into new plate technology. My understanding is that the new plates are going to be flat. There's no more raised letters on those. And they'll still say the same colors, but they won't be raised letters. And so with this changeover, uh, we hope that they're going to be up to speed on not you know, getting in a jam where we can't get plates, is the best way to say that. So we're hoping that will take place. But if you need a plate replacement, you should be able to do that. Over the pages, really an important piece. How many of you had a vehicle stolen in the last several years? Anybody? Yeah, see? So this is another deal. So here's one of the issues with stolen plates we found. I had a dealer call me 
oh, several months ago before the session started, and he said, I had a vehicle stolen, and they recovered it, but I didn't know it was in an impound yard. It's been there for eight months. Nobody notified me, and I said, I'll bet you I know why. Is because the title wasn't registered to your dealership, or they probably notified who was on the title, which was out of state, possibly. Okay? So the question for us is, if we have a stolen vehicle, how can we recover those vehicles when they're not titling our name? Because we can sell them with whatever name's on the title, correct? So uh, as I did some investigation with this, I found that there's an IVS system, an impound vehicle system in place that says that they will track all impounds in the state. So let's say you're in West Valley City, you have a vehicle stolen, and it ends up in Provo impound yard. How in the world would you ever know that that's there? That's the problem. This is the piece that this IVS system fixes. If you have a vehicle stolen, you need to call this gal, Courtney uh, Minchie. She is with uh, UDOT. Uh, she is a tow company investigator and also a motor carry division person. Her contact number is right there. If you have a vehicle that is impounded in a tow yard and you can't find out where it is, you need to call them and say, hey, I have one stolen. As in an impound yard, they can go through this IVS system. And you can actually do that yourself. You can actually go online and look at yourself because it's available open for the public as well as dealers. Okay? So there's a piece for you when you uh, do have um, a stolen vehicle. Okay? Page 33 is our preferred provider, uh, one of our member uh, vendors that uh, we've had a lot of people say, hey, I'm not very satisfied with my DMS system. I need something. I'm just a small dealer. I need to upgrade and modify. That's the new program that we're doing. It starts at 99 bucks a month, so it's cheap enough that you, even a brand new dealer can get in. And then you can kind of build it. It has customization. This program also has all the forms in it, so you don't have to actually purchase the forms and put them on your printer. The system itself will actually print that out. By the way, with our permission, if you have a vendor that's doing our forms and printing the whole form out, they're in copyright violation, so you need to contact us. On page 35 is has to do with sales tax. This has to do with um, that we've seen a lot of what they call Montana brokers. Montana is one of those states that does not have sales tax, and so people are trying to register their vehicles in Montana and some of the other states. Understand and help educate your customer that if they are, if they are uh, setting up a Montana LLC or whatever the case may be, but they have resident in Utah, they have a driver's license in Utah, they will be investigated. Okay, and the fines and the penalties are not nice. I'll just tell you that. So educate your people that you just can't really do this in other states anymore. These kind of things are all going away. They know all the addresses where these attorneys set up these LLCs, and when that address pops up, it just red flags things, and and is uh, and so they're going to um, uh, stop that. But it will be investigated. Also, we've had a number of complaints from people about uh, I bought this, or excuse me, this car was traded in. Uh, and the customer won't give me the title. I don't know if you knew or not, but consumers that trade in cars to you are under the same laws of title delivery as you are. So if you have somebody that won't get a title to you, you call and file a complaint with MVD and they will go get a title or get one made for you. Okay? So that can maybe help you with that. Okay? Who has questions for me before I do my last piece on insurance? Anybody have any questions? Be thinking about that. So we've had a lot of questions on insurance. So at the last piece of this, I invited Vic and Vince, come on up, guys, to talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, and uh, one of the questions that I've had from dealers that these guys can maybe answer for you is um, we've, with a number of catalytic converter thefts that we've talked about, uh, that um, should we be claiming that on our insurance? I think the answer to that is, you need to call these guys first to see if that's something you want to claim versus just calling your insurance company and filing a claim. So move on in. I'll step out and let you guys cover. So that might be something you could additionally talk about and other things that you might want to do. So okay. step. So we can get you in the future. So my name is Vic. This is Vince. Um, we're part of Berman Insurance. And uh, to answer that question with those Cadillac converters, which is definitely a hot topic that we've had from other dealerships across the valley, it doesn't really matter where you're at or if you're at Walmart, or Target, because they're getting hit too. So when that does happen, the first thing you need to do is contact the agent, whether it's us, or it's gonna be your broker that you have, talk about how many cats have been taken. We'll talk about the severity of these cats have been uh, the expense-wise getting them replaced. Some are worth a lot more, and others are worth maybe 50 bucks. So we'll have a conversation about that as well. 
Um, there's only been a few times I can think of that have happened in the past where we filed a claim for these dealerships that have had these cats run away from the law, and uh, we got it taken care of. Uh, but it was a substantial amount. It was probably like in the neighborhood of uh, between 20 to 30 cars that got hit. That's a lot. So if it's going to be small, small peanuts, sort of say, of like two, four, maybe six, we'll talk out loud about what's going to be best for our situation on that. Along with that, please make sure you file a police report. Can't tell you how important this is. Whether you back into somebody, somebody backs into you, it looks like it's no big deal, get a police report. The other person will get the ticket. We have evidence. We can file the insurance claim on either on our insurance or their insurance. Without that police report, <coughs> you got a six to an eight month battle to fight. I can tell you countless stories that have already happened four months into this year with our dealership program and my contractor program, our contractor program, with this. I don't care if it's a bump, paint got scraped. We file a police report that the other person paid for their insurance. Even if they say, hey, I'll pay for it. No, I want a police report. I don't want it to go on my record. That's fine. Please get a police report. Sorry I'm a broken record. Thank you. We've had a couple other ones that have happened in the last six months or so, or uh, having their 18-year-old son or 17-year-old daughter go ahead and hop in the dealer car with the plate, go ahead and play around the block, whatever. Uh, please don't do that. Unless if you give us a call, if they're working at the shop, that's one thing, but if they're not, you're just really exposing the dealership. If something goes south, it ain't going to be pretty there. Okay. The other thing I had for you, too, was the simple misconception about these stolen cars that we were just talking about a minute ago. A lot of dealerships think, well, I've got coverage for either half a million, a million, or even a quarter million dollars of coverage, and this uh, $20,000 car was stolen. Oh, yeah, I've got plenty of coverage. Go ahead and get this car taken care of. That is a misconception that happens all the time, and so many dealerships get burnt with that idea. I'm not sure where they get it or how they got it, but they get burnt every single time because at the end of the day, the adjuster's going to come back and want to get a current inventory list, audit that versus how you're insured, and that's where they go and compare if you're properly covered for the event of loss. Okay. Questions on that one? So I'll take in it is. <laughs> Last thing, business owners, please protect your business. When you have somebody test drive your car, have them fill out a little test drive agreement. Wayne has one that's bulletproof. This thing is awesome. We'll win 19 out of 20 times on this thing. That's a lot better than saying, oh no, i got to call Vince or Vic, make a claim on my insurance, and your insurance rates double or triple the next year. Please protect yourself, take two minutes, Put your logo on it, on every test drive, have them sign it. When they hit somebody, or smack somebody, or rear-end somebody, I can keep going and going and going, um, there's a good chance that we can have their insurance pay for your car. That's all I got. Last thing I want to ask is with the change of inventories and the lack of cars and dealers' inventories fluctuating, how's impo how important is it for them to review with you and how regularly should they do? When we just went on an account, the agent, the, the, guy, the dealer asked his agent six different times, phone call and email, I need to drop my inventory from a million down to half 500,000. The agent said, wait till renewal. That is fake news, 100%. Finish it. What well, you need is a commission check, come on. Pretty much, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it, it depends on the dealer. Each dealer is different as they have different niches. So, if you feel like you want to have uh, a quarterly review, an annual review, twice a year, uh, it depends on the client with what much uh, inventory is coming and going, because we all have our peak seasons and our low seasons, and what we're doing as well, so that's important to think about as well. And there's flexibility all during the year. Oh, yeah. We can do that on the do it once a year and you're stuck. So that can be a big money saver. Last thing I'll mention, thanks guys, last thing I'll mention about insurance is if you're a member of the association, you get a sizable discount with these guys, 10%. Now think about what your insurance bill is and take 10% of that. Does that pay your dues? In most, almost every case it does, right? Okay. Most cases it'll pay for the dues. It might even have a few bucks left over as well, yeah. which is also pretty normal. So if you want the discount, no matter how big or small you are, it applies. But you have to be a member. Membership is only $325, okay? 
So less than a dollar a day. Any questions for these guys? If not, we're going to finish up our class. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Wayne. And by the way, their information is on the very last page. But we're going to jump on back to page 36. This has to do with uh, odometers. If you remember last year, we talked about now exempt vehicles go for 20 years, right? Not 10, like they used to. It's 20 years, but their fa the next 10 years are going to be phased in. This gives you a chart of, so for example, this year, 10 years is what, 2012? That's no, that would have been exempt this year, but this year it's not, because we're adding up to the total of 20 years for that. Okay. Over on page, uh, that was 36 and 37, on page 38, this is a uh, vendor program we put together for your benefit with Burt Brothers, our local uh, tire dealer here. You'll see that there's uh, two or three things in there, but one of them is uh, they have an online wholesale tire ordering and delivery program for you so they can sell you tires wholesale if you don't have some connections there. They can also do uh, uh, inspections and um, certification programs if that's something for you. Page 39 is, I'll uh, end up lastly on, is our membership. Those are the three areas we focus on. Advocacy, that's all our government relations uh, things. Member support, we're here to support you. Whether you're a member or not, we want you to call. You need to understand that if you call me and have a question, I'm probably at some point in the conversation going to ask if you're a member. Or while you're talking, I'm going to look you up on my system. We hope that you're a member. There's value in membership. Linda, I think you're my longest term member in this class. Has there been value of membership? let alone what you get discounts with insurance and our title work and so forth. Over the page is our application form. You can fill it out now, or you can just go out there and tell Shannon you need to be a member. She'll get your information. You can use your credit card for that. And I've also waived the sign-up fee. You'll see that's crossed out. Because you took the education class here, I'll waive that sign-up fee. So it keeps it at $325. And um, we want all of you to be a member. We promote professionalism. You guys are a profession. You're not just a trade, you're a profession. That's why we do education, why we want you to be compliant. We know very well. Legislators ask us all the time, well, how many members do you have? And I said, every single used car dealer in the state of Utah, and some of the new car dealers, in fact, a lot of the new car dealers are members. I said, it's just some of them pay for it, some of them don't. So don't be one of those, be a free rider. I'm not paying, I'm just gonna let, I'm just gonna let Linda pay for me, right? Because she pays her dues, right? <laughs> Don't be a freeloader, right, Linda? Not going to write on your bucket. So anyway, we want you to be members if you need to take care of that. Any questions before we finish? I kept you just a hair over an hour, so thank you for being here. I'll